Okay. Um, so my name is Christina Eden. I run the copyright review program at Hathi Trust, and I also have uh, assorted duties regarding rights and permissions. And one of those is um, taking care of the permissions letters that people send in and want to open works using a Creative Commons license. I've been working more and more with Hathi Trust members that would like to reach out to their departments in their university and get permission to open departmental works. And so a lot of the stuff today is going to be focused around what services and support we provide for that uh, if you're wanting to engage in a project. Um, let me go ahead and forward. Okay, so the, our objectives for today uh, are for you to understand the permission process and how uh, you can use it to open a work in Hathi Trust via a Creative Commons license, and also to learn about what support we have available that can help make that process easier for you, particularly if you're going to be looking at opening multiple works or um, reaching out to departments um, that have a large publication history. Um, the content of the presentation today is not legal advice. Um, I will explain some of the Creative Commons licenses to you and give you some data. However, I can't advise you on choosing a, a license. And um, if you have questions about whether you are not a rights holder, we also can't advise on whether um, you hold the rights to something. So that would be something you would contact your local IP office about if you have questions about that. Today is just about process and some basic information. So who have we been getting inquiries from? We uh, often get directly contacted at Hathi Trust um, by authors, and I was going to say they're mainly authors wanting to open older works that they've received reversion of rights to, but however, my colleague said, no, no, we get them for recent publications as well. So from any authors that currently own their rights and have the ability to sign, there are some who are interested in opening up their publications. We do receive a fair number of inquiries from heirs wanting to see the, the works that their parents created a while ago and they have inherited the rights and are giving permission to open them. Some of these are international, um, uh, international residents as well, not just US. We do occasionally have publishers that are wanting to give open access to their backlist, particularly if they're not commercially um, profiting on them anymore and they would just like to make them open for reading. Um, and also an increasing number of universities wanting to open things. Um, and typically if their um, rights on their university are um, um, non-centralized, then they have to go department to department to get authorization. Generally, we've not received permission um, on a blanket for entire publications of a university. It's typically at departmental level. We also get in inquiries from state agencies, particularly ones where they have not kept a copy of their older publications and they would like access to it. And we get inquiries from researchers uh, studying a particular topic and who say, wouldn't it be so cool if I could get this thing and can I, can I get them to sign a permission form to open these works? So those are all the kinds of uh, questions we get about opening things via a Creative Commons license. So I'll just briefly do um, what's the basic rights upon uh, a book coming into Hati Trust. We, since we have over 16 million volumes, the initial access setting is determined by algorithm. And it's a very basic algorithm that is based upon publication location, publication date, and then that says whether or not it can be viewed globally, in the US only, or whether it's closed in copyright. And so the three basic categories, this is very, very generalized and there are exceptions. And there are things that have bad data that are kept closed because the data is not um, readable by the algorithm. But basically, if it's published in the United States, pre-1923, it's public domain. If it's 23 or later, it's closed and in copyright. And this will be changing January 1, that will move to 1924. 
So everything 1923 will become open um, in the United States. And federal documents, if they can be identified as such from the record, are automatically opened as well. Um, Canada and Australia are opened on a current year minus 120, and anywhere else globally is opened on current year minus 140. Um, and those are just general blanket um, algorithms based on um, length of uh, life and the copyright terms of those areas. Um, there are categories in there that are eligible for copyright review and could possibly be public domain. However, it's a, it's a lot of work. And so we do appreciate it if there, um, uh, we, we can apply a Creative Commons license to something where it's not quite clear, is it public domain? Is it in copyright? We can take a license um, to open it up more quickly. So what does the rights holder need to do? Uh, and it does need to be the rights holder. It can't be somebody um, acting on behalf of them that, um, that would like it open, that, that signs it. It needs to come from the rights holder signing a permission form. Um, we're calling it now the Creative Commons Declaration Form because all of the options are um, Creative Commons licenses. Um, so what the rights holder would do is you represent and warrant that you either hold the rights or you are re representing the copyright holder. You then identify the work, or in the case of multiple works, you would send a list of multiple works, and then you would choose one option. So it's separated out um, public domain dedication because that's a bit more of an extreme choice, dedicating your work to the public domain. And then below that are all the other options of Creative Commons licenses. And you would choose one based on your intent for who can read it, um, what they can do with it, um, and how it can be shared. And I'll go over the, the different Creative Commons licenses um, later on. Um, you then provide your contact information, sign it and date it, and email the form to us, and we process it and open the works. And this is just the easiest way we have that you can tell us that you want to apply a Creative Commons license and release your works. And the works will become viewable and downloadable worldwide when we apply a Creative Commons license to them. Um, and also they will be downloadable um, to anyone, not just members only. So with one single permission form, you can either use it to cover one item, one book. Typically, this is when we have an interaction with an author and they have one book or fewer books. Um, when working with an institution, generally they send a spreadsheet and just say, see attached. You can use a single permission form as long as the same CC license applies to everything. If you want to choose different batches to be represented by a different CC license, then you would need to break it up and have a different form for each batch that would be um, under a different license. Um, but there is absolutely no need to send in uh, a, another form for every single book you want to open. Um, you, can, you can combine them. The other thing is uh, when you're citing the work on the permission form, it can either be for a fixed item in Hathi Trust, um, such as one single book. In this case, if, if l'organisation de, I can't pronounce French, um, if there are duplicate copies of that exact edition, that exact book, the permission form would cover all duplicate copies. It would not cover different editions. It would not cover different publishers or anything that had, like, say, a new introduction or anything that has a difference to it. That would have to be specifically called out. But if it is a duplicate, exact duplicate, uh, we can use the same fixed citation to apply to all duplicates. Um, a citation can also preempt, um, anticipate if there's a missing volume on a record, say you have a serial run, and this is Cornell Studies, and say for example, volumes one through 31, we were missing volume 29, but they expected to get it to us, or it's possible it could be scanned in the future, 
you can go ahead and cite the entire range that you want to open and if there should be a missing volume then that um, permission agreement can be pointed to in the future to say okay this covers that one that we just got in um, you'd have to let us know that it's now in and that we should go back and find the permission agreement we don't have anything that is an alert in our system other than um, somebody who wants to see it open will let us know okay go back um, add it to the permission form so uh, this is particularly useful in the case of uh, series serial sets if you know that you have rights and want to give it for a date range uh, you can just go ahead and state that and then if there are anything missing that come in later then we can go back and just use the same form what we can't take is a permission form for something that has no identifier and no record in Hathi Trust. So we need to have at least uh, a record ID to go on. Um, and also we can use um, an item ID. But if it's not in yet and there's no record and there's no ID, we can't take a permission form for it. So in that case, go through your digitization process, get it into Hathi Trust, and then contact us with a permission agreement. So you don't want to, if you're going for multiple items, um, don't try to assemble the list yourself by putting an intern or a student to cutting and pasting and searching and creating a spreadsheet on their own. Um, too much work for you, too much. It also creates more work for us as well because then we have to um, verify individual items and often we'll find mistakes and and then we have to come back to you and say, what, what was this? Was this a mistake or what? So we can run reports for you. It makes it much easier for us and hopefully much easier for you. We have a few day turnaround time once we get a request in for a rights holder report. Um, so if you were wanting to do that, what you would do is uh, send an email to the general user support line and ask for a rights holder report. Um, any communications we do with a rights holder, we have to have it recorded in our ticket system, and that's because we need to have a long-term record preserved of communications regarding opening in copyright works in Hathi Trust. So um, that's why I'm not giving you my personal email to contact for this. It'll have to get moved anyways into our ticketing system so we retain a record um, of the communications with the rights holder. So if you haven't done this before, what you're going to get is an HTS ticket number, support ticket number, and that will uh, come back to you and be used in the subject line for any communications about that particular project. Um, and the communications will be coming to you from the email um, feedback at issues.hatitrust.org. Uh, those typically all get assigned to me, so it will be me responding, but it will be through our system. So to ask for a query, what you're going to do is send an email to our user support line. Um, you can, the, um, they will figure it out uh, and figure out who to route it to, but some things that would help them figure it out faster would be you saying, I'm requesting a rights holder report so that we can open books in Hachi Trust with a Creative Commons license and then they'll know right away I get assigned to it. <laughs> they'll assign it to me. Um, what you want to do is uh, think in advance about the pr uh, parameters of a search of the mark data that would help turn up uh, most of your publications. Um, typically that means saying who you believe the author would be um, cataloged as or the publisher um, and if you know more advanced searching you can also tell us other um, parameters that you want as well so basically the the, the question on the right um, works could you please provide a rights holder report where Florida Geological Survey is listed either as the author or as the publisher um, that'll do it um, if you want to be more selective and think that doing that would get you a lot of um, false hits, then you can give us more to go on. But even that basic will do it. So then we run a query and we set up a spreadsheet and share it with you. 
Um, and I'll just go into briefly um, mark data. I'm not sure if there's anybody on the call. We thought we might get some authors, individual authors on the call that might not know what mark is. And uh, also, if you don't know how to view the Mark Hati Trust record, this is really useful information to know. So it's going from the catalog record URL. What you're going to do is add dot mark to the end of it. Uh, it's um, circled in the orange box on the top there. And that will take you from what is the basic data display, which does not show everything. It's just the public view to the mark data display. And that's going to give you everything that we have in the Zephyr Mark data. So if you, that may give you um, an idea of, um, better idea of whether or not it's something you hold the rights to, and it just gives you a richer data set if you're looking for that. So that can help you say what you think we should be running a query on. Any of the fields in the Mark data, uh, we can query. When we run a report for you, we're going to include the fields um, catalog, the catalog ID, which is also the record ID. We will include um, an item ID, HathiTrust volume item identifier, title, author, typically all the publishing information, and enumeration and chronology if it is a series or a monographic serial. And if you want, if there are other things that would help you reconcile the list to what you think is your own, you can request any other data in that report as well, such as OCLC number. We don't typically include OCLC number off the bat, so you would need to say what other information would help you sort through the list. Um, so you can put in special requests. And the information that uh, is included is intended to help you determine whether or not you hold the rights to. So instead of you having to go individually to each record, we want to try to have that all in the sheet so that you can glance over it um, and have everything you, you need right there to say, okay, this is probably this is ours, this is not ours. Here's what a sample report's going to look like. So this was for the Florida Bureau of Geology. Um, it gives the title, the author, publisher, um, Published date can be confusing because if it's a serial, the published date will often be the first date of publication of volume one. Uh, if you look over to the right a bit, we see a rights date, and if that's different, that means that it's not volume one, it's probably a later volume. Um, and so the rights date is actually probably the exact date of publication, and that is the date that the copyright gets um, um, runs the algorithm on is um, based on the um, the right state, not the first date of volume one. Um, and then just the the Zephyr CID on the right, that column is another name for the record ID. That is the um, Zephyr is our catalog management system, um, and so the record ID will sometimes also be called the Zephyr ID. So that's what you'll get. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm just going to go into a little bit about the unique identifiers because this is how we like you to identify the works that you want to open. It makes it very unambiguous and we don't need to interpret a citation. So we want you to cite where you can using either the record ID or the item ID. And here's how to find it. So if you're looking at the catalog view of the item, and that's the page that has all the information about the work, not actually looking at the book itself, there's going the URL is going to be something like catalog.hatitrust.org slash record and then a number. That number is the record ID. So all you would have to do is uh, cut that, copy that, and that is um, how you could refer to it. Um, all items on a serial set should be on the same record, and you can use that to refer to all of them. You don't need to cut and paste individually. You can just say everything on record ID X, um, and that'll cover them, every, anything on that record. Whereas the item ID refers to a specific scan. So duplicate volumes of the same, the same book scanned by different places will have 
different item IDs. They will all get a unique item ID because it refers to the volume itself. And that one is when you're looking at the view, of, when you click through to say, I want to look at the view of the book, uh, it will give you the URL that has in it ID equals. And that string of letters followed by numbers, that is the item ID. The first part of it, COO means the place it came from was Cornell. Uh, and then the numbers after that are Cornell's um, barcode, unique barcode. Um, so you're going to look for the thing following ID equals, and it ends at the semicolon, and that is the item ID. So once you get the report, it's your job to finalize it. So what you're going to want to do is remove any of the things that are that you do not have the rights for, that are false hits. Um, if you're unsure, then you either need to remove them from the list or you need to sort out what the rights are by looking at your contracts, by talking to your departments, or by seeking permission from the authors in the works that you don't know whether or not they have rights to it. Um, so when you've got your final list of IDs that you're sure you have the rights to and are authorized to open with a CC license, then you get to send it to us and choose a Creative Commons license. So which one do you choose? Um, I can tell you right now about the various components of the CC licenses. Um, I can't really tell you which one is most commonly chosen. Uh, I've seen them all, all chosen. Um, so the very basic one is by. By means attribution. Um, other than that, the work can be used freely, remixed, shared. Um, it can be used commercially, it can be made into derivative works. Um, the others are various uh, mixes of NC, which uh, NC means no commercial use. ND means no derivatives, it must be distributed exactly the same. And then SA means share alike, anything created from it must be put under the same Creative Commons license. Um, if you are wanting to encourage distribution, remixing, reuse at the highest possible levels, uh, but still keep your rights and not make it public domain, then you'd want to use the CC BY. Um, other than that, it's a discussion uh, with your department or a personal decision of which one you think best represents your rights. Um, and once you have chosen and applied a CC license, it is not easy and technically it really it cannot be rescinded. Um, so think about it, think about what you want to accomplish um, and then apply that one. The other option is the CC0 public domain dedication and that means that the rights holders waive all copyright and related um, rights in the item. Um, it must be applied by the owners of the copyrighted work. So this is not where you believe something is public domain and you want to mark it as such. This means you own the rights or you were the creator um, and want to waive your rights in it. Um, it means that you're making the work public domain throughout the world internationally. So we do allow this if um, if a work is public domain in the United States, but the international rights are uncertain, and there may still be foreign rights, we allow you to apply this one uh, to it to, to at least clarify the international rights of the work. And oh, I should also say that um, this is the choice of some state agencies who want to um, who want to say that they believe their works are already public domain and they are opposed to choosing one of the other CC licenses because they believe that makes it more restrictive. Some of them have been okay choosing the CC0 license to um, publicly, visibly state that their works are public domain. So once you've got that all chosen, you're going to send the list and the permission form back on your ticket uh, to feedback at issues.hatitrust.org. 
only select one CC license. Don't check them all off because then I'll have to come back to you and say, you need to pick one, <laughs> just one. Um, and then attach the list, attach your list uh, of things that are covered by that agreement. What do we do? Uh, well, we have paper filing still. Yay. <laughs> um, we're still tied to paper. This is the process that was started eight years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and we have not yet, we've um, tried to streamline it. However, we're still very paper-based. And so that um, makes it easier for us when we have things in order uh, in advance of receiving forms and stuff. Uh, if we have any questions, if I have any questions on the form and how it was filled out and what's being opened, I will come back to the rights holder. Um, and at that point, emails can be documentation of further decisions um, that can be included in the file with the permission form. So once I've done that, I contact systems um, and they will go ahead and uh, inst um, initiate the rights change in the Hathi Trust rights database. Um, once that happens, the book is available immediately. Uh, it will change the right statement to whatever Creative Commons license you chose, and the book will be fully downloadable by anyone anywhere in the world. Um, it is a little confusing because it takes a couple days beyond that for the work to be re-indexed, and so the link will still say limited search only view, um, and you'll have to wait a few days uh, for it to update and say full text available. So if you're going to plan on um, advertising, um, give it a few days afterwards to make sure that you're not confusing people who go to it and say, oh, I can't get in. Um, but if you click on it, it will open. All right, some hints and best practices. So if you really don't want to do a whole lot of work, and I'm happy to support that, um, really all we need is a HathiTrust record ID and maybe a title and something. So somebody sent me a, a sheet with um, this format and it was really handy. I have an easy way that I can grab all volume IDs on a record in like two seconds flat. So all you have to do is give me the record ID and just say we're opening all volumes on this record, including all supplements. Or you could say something like, we're opening all the in copyright volumes on this record. Um, we will not apply a Creative Commons license to something that is already public domain. So just by default, if there are any public domain things that have already been opened on that record, we will skip applying the CC license to them. So you don't actually need to specifically call them out. We will do that by default. So you don't need to set an intern or a student towards uh, copying and pasting every item ID on a record. Just send me the record ID. If you only want to send uh, permission for a single volume, basically all I need is the title and then like one of the unique identifiers, either the item ID or the record ID. If you want to include author date edition, that's fine too. But um, the unique ID makes it really easy for me to tell what you're talking about. If you want to uh, be proactive and set it up for gaps in a serial run, as we talked about before, what you're gonna do is cite the dates, the date range or the volume number range and the record ID. So you would say record 00059563 and we wanna open volumes one through 31. Um, then if some volumes are missing and they're added later, we can open them up using that citation. Uh, so some of the things that people want to open have already been through a copyright review. Um, sometimes we only open things at public domain in the United States through a copyright review. We don't research the international rights. And so if you want to apply a CC license to something, to uh, open it up globally as well, that's okay. Um, we will not apply a CC license if the work has been determined to be public domain globally. So um, some cases, some cases we will accept a, a permission form and in others we won't if the work is already open. 
so these are some of the common questions that we get. Um, so if you get them from somebody else, now you can know how to respond. Um, can I open works that I own the rights to, but were scanned by a different Hathi Trust institution? Yes, the, the, um, the library that holds the book or where it was scanned isn't important for giving permission. So all that matters is that this is an item for which you hold the rights, not where it was scanned. So for example, Cornell can give permission to open up books that were scanned at Michigan if they were a Cornell publication and Cornell holds the rights. Um, the permission agreement will apply to all duplicate copies that are scanned from multiple locations. Again, all you have to do is be the rights holder of that particular item. Doesn't matter whose library collection it's coming from. What if you don't hold the rights? So who can say what should be opened? Um, we have to say that only the rights holder or an authorized representative of the rights holder is the one who can positively identify what works they hold the rights to and for which they can grant a license. So that means if you've got a researcher coming to you saying, uh, could you go to this agency and, and um, tell them to open the books and the agency does not know if they hold the rights or not, that means we're, we're stuck. We have nobody that says they're authorized um, with the rights. Um, if we have any doubt about who um, who holds the rights, we're going to seek confirmation from the rights holder um, to ask questions about can this different edition be opened, can additional volumes be opened, or can differing ser serial titles be opened. Um, this is often a communication from a researcher or somebody wanting to read the item that has um, brokered a deal with the rights holder and then later volumes come in and they want those open too, we have to go back to the rights holder to confirm that, um, that the new volumes are also covered because only the rights holder can say what is covered. So again, that works if you say, I want X agency to open up their publications in Hathi Trust, wouldn't it be cool if the United Nations, the League of Nations opened up their publications. I agree, yes, it would be very cool. However, um, we would prefer that you not broker that. I mean, broker it so as far as if you have a connection with them and can encourage them to contact us, then we can work with them. But we, um, we can't have you sign on their behalf. Um, we cannot take a blank check letter from them. So if they say in a letter, yes, please open up all my publications. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but you figure them out. No, we can't do that. So what we could do is create a report. And I understand that some agencies, it's difficult to get a hold of the authorized person who can sign it. So we can work with you to create a report in advance that we think is cleaned up enough that it's good to just take and send to them and they won't have to do a whole lot of work, but they need to look it over and as the rights holder affirm that these are the things that they can sign for. Um, and then we can open them. So a couple more questions that we get. Um, state documents are often a confu confusing thing. We have people saying, um, my state law says that we should be able to have public access to state documents. Is this enough to make them public domain in Hathi Trust? And the answer is no. Public access and public domain are not the same things. Um, we're also, we've, we have looked into this and we have currently decided that we're not in a position to interpret the law. Um, Kyle Courtney has done a great job at the State Copyright Resource Center of um, listing what all the laws are, and we've looked at some of them and tried to interpret them. But at this point, the easiest thing for us to do would be for a state agency to come to us and be willing to an, apply a CC license. Um, the other thing is, is that we actually, this goes back to only the rights holder can say, we need to know what the documents are that they are identifying can be opened so to just say all of Michigan, state of Michigan documents can be opened, well, there might be some in there that are under different rights and contracts. Um, 
and we are not in a position to make those judgment calls. And so we need a rights holder, an active rights holder, to identify what works and, and tell us what the rights are to them. And lastly, two questions that are very frequent. Um, the rights holder has given me permission to download a copy of their work in order to translate it, reprint it, use it, but they don't want to grant a CC license for anyone else. But if they want to keep it closed. Can you send me a copy? And the answer is no. We do not uh, distribute in copyright works um, based on a, a letter of permission from a rights holder. So in order to get that work, they would need to sign and apply a Creative Commons license, and then the person wanting it can get it, download it, as can anyone else who wants to read the book. And the related question to that is, the rights holder says, I want to get a copy of the book that I hold the rights to because I want to usually reprint it. Can you send me a copy? Um, but they don't want to give access to anybody else. And the answer to that is no. You need to apply a Creative Commons license, then you can get the copy for yourself, but also everybody else can read it as well. So um, we don't engage in distribution of in copyright works. Um, we can apply a CC license, and then that is um, available equally to anybody to download. So what we went over today was understanding the permissions process and how to apply a Creative Commons license to works in Hathi Trust, and to give you an idea of what support is available if you're wanting to engage in an institutional or local project that would involve multiple items. And we have about 20 minutes left, and I'm gonna open this up for questions. Uh, you can either put them in chat, or if you're able, you can unmute your microphone and ask a question. I'll ask a question of you. Um, are any of you interested in uh, working on local rights projects? Um, do you have anything particular in mind? Non, yes, we work with non-member institutions. We've worked with um, uh, government document librarian groups. Um, we've worked with state agencies, so there's no uh, there's no requirement that someone be a member to ask for a report of their items and to grant permission. Um, Agricultural bulletins and circular documents you'd like to open up, fantastic. Uh, send an email to feedback and let us know how we should, should search for them uh, and send you a report so that you can check them out. Yes, uh, interested in opening up state documents, but it's difficult to find an authorized representative. That is so true. Very, very true. Um, we've had two, two states do it successfully. One took around two years to work it through. Um, they did not want to sign uh, a form and apply a Creative Commons license. They wanted to just send a letter, and the letter had um, squishy language. Um, so that was difficult to work with. Um, but we got it done in the end because um, there was there was a Hathi Trust member very interested in seeing them done. Um, I don't know where it's ripe for people. To, I'd say if you have a connection, go for it. We had a connection with a librarian at the State Library of Michigan, and so she was able to push through and find um, the correct person who could sign for Department of Ed publications of Michigan because the State Library of Michigan is part of the Department of Ed, and so she was instrumental in getting those opened. Um, but other State of Michigan documents she couldn't get uh, just yet because it was, it was a matter of finding out who could, who could sign and then convincing them that it needed to be done, too. Right. 
perhaps start with your local state librarian. They often know a lot and are really invested in it. Yeah, Michelle, thanks for being on the call. Uh, I appreciate all the work you've done at Cornell in opening up stuff. Um, Renata, your question about um, if your institution is only one of a group of rights holders, is it okay to apply a CC license? That's getting into um, legal advice. Um, I think I can give you the basic information that for a work which has joint rights holders, um, unless it's the public domain dedication, which we believe needs all rights holders to agree, um, it only takes one rights holder, one joint rights holder to opt to apply a CC license. But you'd wanna check that with your, um, with your counsel. And um, also contracts would affect that as well. If there were contracts um, surrounding the publication rights, um, those might override your right to, to engage in a license. So you'd also wanna check that. If, uh, if anyone is wanting to um, start a local rights project, we have a couple of people who've had experience in that already, and I think they would probably be willing to help give advice. Um, so reach out to us if you are looking to get something started um, and want to ask somebody who's done it themselves, what are some of their lessons learned? I think we could probably connect you with uh, others. I was thinking of Cornell. <laughs> You've definitely got experience. And, yep, and CDL. All right, well, it looks like we've slowed down on the questions. Um, this recording will be up on YouTube. And uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, you can contact the user support uh, email and that will get sent to me as well. Thank you for coming to this uh, webinar today and good luck with your rights projects. <laughs>